Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, one of our final conference sessions uh, called the Data Leadership Framework Primer, or Primer, depending on your preference there. Uh, this will be presented by Gene Boomer, Principal Consultant at DataThink. And uh, I, can, I can speak uh, directly to this point. Gene was there at the very beginning of the conceptualization of uh, this framework. So uh, he's an excellent source for us to be learning about it today. Uh, as a reminder, uh, everyone is muted during these sessions, so please submit your questions in the Q&A window on the right of the screen, and we'll get to as many of those as possible at the end of the talk. So let's begin. Uh, Gene, thank you. Welcome. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Tony, for the introduction, and I welcome everybody who's attending the virtual version of EDW this week. I hope you've been taking advantage of the number of sessions and the, and the great number of speakers out there. Uh, I, I've been sitting in on sessions uh, throughout the week and uh, they've been very good. And I know it's not the same as being in person. I mean, personally, I like to be in person, uh, but this is better than nothing. And I think the, you still can gain a lot of benefits and, and education and, and things to ponder uh, as you kind of reflect on this week and then go back into your organizations and, and try to make changes or try to move ahead or whatever it is you're, that you're trying to do, whether it be big or small, that you're actually moving forward. Okay, as Tony mentioned, this session is on the Data Leadership Framework prim, uh, Primer. Um, before we get started on that, a little bit about me. Um, I am... Uh, Principal Consultant with DataThink. I have plenty of years of experience. Um, started in IT, migrated to data, been in that space for nearly 20 years, multiple disciplines. I've worked in a number of different industries. I'm a founding member and current president of the DEMA Indiana chapter of DEMA International. Uh, that has been a very rewarding uh, experience uh, for me. I hold a CDMP certification at the master level, and I was a contributing author to the current release of the DIMBOK. I was a contributing author to the reference and master data section. Okay, topic of discussion. We're going to uh, look at data management issues, data value, the actual data leadership framework. It's based on the book, as Tony mentioned, that Data Diversity put out uh, by Anthony Elgram. I mean, here is, Here's the book. It's not a very big read, but it has a ton of information in it. And we're gonna go through the categories and disciplines and then how you kind of can make use of this. The first thing I'd like to focus on is the common data management issues. And if you look within your own organizations or just listen to some of the speakers this week, none of this should really be news to you with regards to some of the issues that exist probably within your organization. You know, you don't have the consistent view of X, whatever X may be. Uh, this basically has an effect on the growth and retention. You have sporadic and battle, sporadic and brittle data integration. Uh, this is pretty common. It causes what uh, is affectionately referred to as the swivel chair integration as multiple systems have to be accessed. Basically, the joke is that our, unfortunately, our business users have to swap from system to system to get the information uh, they need because they're actually integrating it real time by jumping from system to system. And I'll say this has an effect on efficiency and productivity. And then the infamous authoritative trusted source, whatever they, that may look like within your organization, the idea is try to get um, to a trusted uh, trusted environment. However, what usually happens is that uh, business users will resort to using whatever warehouse mart, spread mart exists. And based on gut feel as for where the uh, best data resides, I have a lot of industry experience in uh, insurance. And so um, the, the, uh, the uh, biggest area of folks who do this are your actuaries. Uh, they're, they're extremely smart, uh, smart folks. Uh, but a couple of uh, 
problematic issues for data people is one, for them, current state is 100 years. And then two, they just want the data. They don't want you to refine it or do anything else. They want to do it. And then they want to apply all the massaging. Of course, that could be problematic. Uh, you'd rather have them operate from a trusted source than allow them to apply their actuarial specific sauce to the data. And of course, this has an ultimate effect on risk and trust. Ah, just people, process, and technology. How many times have we heard of PPT? You know, it's always about uh, regarding people, finding the right people at the right time, some type of delivery process. It's usually SDLC or some form of agile, and then using right technology, uh, preferably the cloud. That's kind of where this, where everything is moving now. Okay, but there's some issues with this when you're just focused on PPT and you forget about data. And I have some quotes here, um, no names given, of course, that I've actually heard in my career regarding uh, data and how we need to handle that within the PPT environment. Uh, the most, uh, the funniest one, which I had to actually stop myself from laughing was, why haven't you stood up a data lake yet? Like data lake was the magic thing that was going to solve all of our data woes. When will, and I've, this next one I've been asked by multiple uh, business leaders, actually multiple leaders, usually all in IT. When will data governance be finished? And I know some of you are snickering right now because as we know, data governance will not ever be finished. Um, why does the logical data architecture not specify any technology? Usually I get asked that by CIOs who are really CTOs and they wanna see the actual technology. You specify data virtualization, why don't you have Denodal? You're specifying integration, why don't you have Informatica? You're, I mean, you're specifying visualization, why don't you uh, have Cognos? I mean, it's just on and on and on. So that puts us in a, particular awkward situation. So one of the things we want to do is include it and have the PPT with the focus of data. So you want to have the right data people, you know, with the right data skills, right? You want to follow a data centric development life cycle, not a SDLC or a waterfall or anything like that. And then you want to use the right technology in context of the use of the data. And that's the thing that we kind of miss up on. Um, I do like this quote by Steve Jobs. He's absolutely correct. Unfortunately, every organization will say they want to hire the smartest individuals. They'll get them hired, and then they won't really listen to what they have to say. Uh, I know a number of you probably have actually experienced that. But what does this mean for us moving forward? Well, we don't really want data coders. We want data provocateurs. You probably have had have heard that phrase quite a quite often. Uh, this week is one of Tom Redmond's uh, phrases. He believes that we should be data provocateurs within our organizations to be able to help affect changes and uh, provide better understanding of what we need to do with data. And also that uh, we don't deliver data. That's another misnomer. We drive outcome-based insights. I mean, that's kind of where we need to kind of look at this. And we just don't use technology. We use fit-for-purpose technology. Uh, they're, they're, the approach with technology is it could be polyglot, right? It could be I use one thing for a data store and I use one thing for integration. I use a different thing for integration. It all depends what is the best fit that is needed for your organization. Data value. Now, you probably have heard some discussions about uh, data value this week and some things of what data is and what it is not. Uh, the phrase about data is the new oil is really a misnomer. Um, and I know some of the speakers have said we should ban that kind of connotation uh, moving forward. Uh, because uh, data value is actually a representation of the difference in business outcomes with data versus without it. Now, I'm old, been around for a long time. So when I started out, 
everything was 100% application centric and data was just exhaust. It was just the output of the application. The application was the most important thing. We have worked very hard to kind of flip that. We're not there yet, but we are closer than we've ever been before to get it to understood that uh, we need to be data centric. And then the apps just basically subscribe uh, or consume or provide data uh, as opposed to be driving the use of data. Um, and also note that it's a positive change of business because we want to maximize, uh, we want to, uh, in, we want to have a positive change in business outcomes to maximize through leader datorship. So that's on us. We need to do that. And then, of course, if you could generate data value, uh, it actually gives you a metric in how data leadership is actually doing within your organization. Uh, there are generally only three ways to measure data value. It's either increase of revenue, decrease cost, or manage risk. Uh, those are the macro uh, values, ways to measure. Uh, I know some other folks will say there's like four or five or six uh, ways to measure data value, but at the macro level, it's really just those three. So we all have a different focus, right? We want to change the typical IT to business area relationship. Uh, it, this is a quote that's in the book, and I know if uh, some of our BAs or um, data quality people are on the, on the session here, they might not like that first bullet point. Uh, and I think that's to kind of to get a response. It's that business, choir, business requirements are important, but they should be the end all to get all, right? Um, sprint execution, obviously we wanted to iterate uh, through, our, through a process, right? Um, and even on the app side, uh, uh, sprints, in a lot of cases is like many versions of waterfalls or a or a you know kind of weird weird view of a waterfall um but there is some um uh, still issues with that of course we want to have elastic uh, delivery dates i've been asked numerous times when are we going to be done with x and I, it's it's always tough to say that i'm going to be done with x exactly at this point in time i got in the habit of doing like three or six months groupings where I said, this is what was kind of imminent and what we'd be expected to deliver. And then the next three or six months of what would be uh, proposed to be delivered. And then the next three or six months would be what uh, we could predict to deliver, right? And so going through that uh, actually helped manage the process going forward and helped our business folks understand some of that. So we want to actually look at it from, a, from this simple virtuous circle. Uh, we want to have a baseline that we measure from. We want to identify improvements and then actually implement those, those improvements. And we just want to keep cycling through that, right? And uh, the, the data-centric development lifecycle actually allows you to do that. So if you kind of are familiar with that particular framework, you can actually see how this kind of works with that. And we want to stop talking about working and start working, right? Um, and we want to use the data leadership framework as our guide. So here, there's really nothing really important on here except for a couple of Dilbert uh, strips. Uh, the first strip here, believe it or not, I've actually sat in meetings where that one has occurred. And maybe some of you have also sat in meetings where that has occurred. Uh, the one on the bottom is basically said, hey, we do all this work. Now we just need to add a pinch of leadership when in reality we need to do all the work to help provide the understanding of what data leadership is and how it could be effective within our organizations. Okay, so here is the data leadership framework. Um, this part of the presentation might get a little dry, so I'm going to apologize for that now. But basically, it's made up of categories and disciplines. So the items on the top are the categories, and then the items on the side are basically the disciplines, right? So there's 25 disciplines across the five categories. And we'll go through each category and kind of just give a little discussion about each one of them, and then kind of do a review, review at the end. 
So the first category is access, right? So enabling connection to data assets, right? And so that basically has five disciplines uh, within that uh, environment. Oh, one of the things I should mention too, it's a framework, right? So you don't need to have all 25 in your organization. You, you pick the ones that make sense for your organization because some of them just may not apply or you may not be at a right maturity level to implement them but just know that they're there and you can make use of them. Okay, so if we're looking at access, we're basically looking at security, data architecture, data wrangling, development, and support and operations, right? Uh, data security, uh, this is something that's kind of near and dear to me uh, personally. The last few organizations I've worked at, I had a really good relationship with the privacy officer and the compliance officer if they are two different people, sometimes they're not. And that has been a very uh, good relationship so that we have an understand of this concept of permissible use. Uh, data architecture, I think we all know the importance of that, uh, but it's more than just laying out the data architecture. We also have to ensure it's in alignment with uh, data governance and that the architecture based on business strategy and not IT deliverables, if that makes sense. Uh, data wrangling, that's to enable data discovery, right? A lot of, lot of organizations and a lot of IT organizations look at data wrangling as a bad thing, but really allowing data wrangling allows that initial discovery that actually helps refine the items that you actually want to make uh, available to the whole organization. And they're going to constantly iterate. This is where I usually had a good working relationship with the actuaries, and we try to uh, help them understand this, that their importance in it, and how we can actually evolve this and then have data assets that could be used throughout the organization. Um, development, um, basically ideas about, uh, you know, extending data capabilities and uh, restricting constraints, and the concept of understanding for, for purpose technologies. Service and, and DevOps, although I think I might like the word data ops better here, but basically is uh, ongoing activity to um, to measure and to uh, handle issues, the, those types of things. And then also within your environment, whatever you stand up, you need to be able to eat your own dog food. So you need to use what you're asking everybody else to use. I have seen in some organizations where that was not the case. And um, so that's kind of important from that aspect. Refine, we want to refine and optimize the data for use. Metadata, obviously very important, but more so is the metadata that's, um, uh, you gotta watch out what's called low data, low data value density metadata. Technical metadata is very easy to get. There's many tools that provide that but an overwhelming amount of technical metadata is actually ends up providing low data value density. The more high value data value density, metadata is business metadata. So you need to engage your data stewards in your business area SMEs to be able to tie the, their vernacular into your architecture, into your uh, data environment. Uh, master data goes without saying, if you can't, master your data, I don't I don't see how you could actually ever get to the point of having a trusted source, right? So master data will be your primary primary entities within your organization. Like for an insurance company, it would be customer and policyholder and claim and agent, producer, those types of things. Enrichment is being able to add data, usually for, you know, from external sources, um, marketing, Marketing folks usually really want to be able to make use of that, do an enrichment. And curation is the, you're trying to reduce noise um, and balance the weight of, of data asset. I've unfortunately worked for some organizations. They said, hey, we're gonna build this data hub or this data warehouse, whatever, and we're gonna put everything in it, right? In reality, you don't wanna do that. Uh, you want to only want to put what's in there what's actually being consumed and could be used because then you spend too much time on things that might be used. That goes back to the, the whole philosophy. If you build it, they will come. 
Unfortunately, I worked at uh, one organization where uh, we spent five years and $25 million producing a data warehouse for uh, marketing area. And we ended up only having one subscriber after all that time and money. So the philosophy of building to overcome, it, it just, it's, it's a fallacy, right? So think of enrichment as adding value and think of curation as removing noise. So if you kind of keep it in that context, then I think overall uh, you'll be better off. I think this particular area, as far as setting up data value, is the most important. Um, if you don't have a handle on these particular items, it's going to be hard to produce the data value that you want to have for your organization. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work for um, a number of organizations over the years, both as a um, employee and as a consultant. And I can tell you over time, I've come to realization that uh, these five items here are extremely critical uh, to be able to uh, affect business outcomes with your with uh, the data within your organization. Adopt. Okay, now we want to start utilizing our data assets. So the first two categories basically kind of set you up to be able to get data value from your data assets. So these next categories are about how do we actually use that or realize that, right? So basically the disciplines in this category are data modeling and data warehousing, traditional reporting, dashboards, systems integration, and then uh, emerging data technologies. I think most of us understand the importance of data modeling and warehousing. Um, the, the, the impact of the cloud, quote unquote the cloud, kind of, kind of, has kind of muddled some to some degree some of this, um, and and I was amused by the leaders saying we need to get out to the cloud. And I know the benefits of that, right? Because the cloud basically is a cloud is just a data center that's not on prem, right? And because it's not on prem, uh, the organization doesn't have to worry about the actual underlying infrastructure. But the data architecture does not change, right? It should not change, right? You just want to make use of the advantages that you have uh, in the cloud uh, to do data modeling and warehousing. Traditional reporting, right? That's usually referred to as descriptive analytics. Um, and in most organizations, this really is the used the most and somewhat neglected the most, right? Because we're looking at the shiny objects, right? Which is the analytics, predictive analytics, and AI, machine learning. And then we kind of forget that traditional reporting supports the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. So, and if you don't have a good handle on this, this is what leads to the spread marts uh, and other types of things. Also leads to people getting into a meeting and they're all, um, pointing out uh, different numbers, whether it's different number of customers, revenue, whatever it is. So this is an important discipline to kind of have an understanding of. Interactive dashboards and visualizations. Um, the the idea of self service, self service analysis, I'm very high on. Uh, some organizations have actually done this pretty well. But the idea is that for that to work, you obviously have to have business involvement and you want to have business partners actually as part of that effort uh, to do that because if you just try to push it out as an IT only thing again it's gonna hey I built this will you come it's just like nah it's just gonna be problematic if you're not if you're not keeping the uh, the what the business does in your mind what your organization does in, in your mind when you're going through these categories of the DLF, uh, that's going to be problematic. I've heard some people mention, I think John Landley mentioned the fact that you should be looking at balance sheets. I've looked at balance sheets for my organizations. Go look at the Ken, uh, K, K, K-12s or K-10 documents. I mean, go look at the documents that are actually put out 
by, by regulatory reason that your organization has to provide to their shareholders and to regulatory bodies. Have an understanding what that is. You also want to speak in the nomenclature of the business, not in the nomenclature of IT. This is something I had to learn over the years. No one cared about my really fancy dancy data model or the fact that I could actually, you know, kind of whip up this uh, ETL workflow, uh, you know, snazzy workflow, whatever. They Business partners don't care about that. They want to know how is this affecting them and how does it help them affect the bottom line. So we need to speak in the vernacular business. Scott Taylor has also talked about that. That's about the, the concept of telling stories. We need to be able to do that and effectively do that. And um, now some of us are not all made to be able to do that, and that's okay. But within your organizations, there's got to be someone who, who, can, who can speak, who can tell a good yarn, as it were, uh, to be able to present to uh, business leaders and even IT leaders, quite frankly, to be able to explain the kind of journey that we need to go on to to provide the best use and value from our data assets. Systems integration. This one has done a lot. I'm sure that within your organization, especially if it's a large organization, you got literally hundreds or thousands of integration flows. Um, the, the thing about system integration is you want to be able to design and make use of that where it becomes second nature, right? So you want to, you want to uh, monitor, you have to monitor the integration, you have to, um, and those types of things, but you really want to focus on automation. If you had to build out an integration or um, fix or address an issue with integration, Having the abilities of automation is just going to be so much better with regards to delivery and the actual end result. One of my things, uh, and I say this even now with the client I'm working with, is I'm a big fan of consistency. I don't even care if you do it wrong as, you're, as long as you're consistently doing wrong. But when you're doing it varied number of ways, which I've seen on the integration side, that's just a recipe for disaster. So you want to be able to coalesce in a common approach to do that and automate as much as possible. And then you do want to take advantage of emerging data technologies, right? Like I said, we should be looking at our data architecture as a polyglot environment. You know, maybe we use uh, RDMS for, uh, an o for an ODS, an operational data store, but then we use a graph database to actually manage um, uh, networks or, or or contacts and things like that. So the idea of just saying, well, I must do everything in this database or on this platform, we need to kind of look at that. And this was another area that took me some time to get my head wrapped around and to be able to uh, effectively look at it. Um, I, I am a big fan of uh, graph databases to be able to uh, handle relationships, and then once to be able to quickly traverse a relationship, but then once I have the node I'm looking for, then I could dive into a traditional data store uh, sitting in our RDBMS to get the kind of data that I want. Um, but all this should represent, uh, all this should be in included and thought about with, with the, with the regards to your environment. But the point here is too, that technology represents really only a small part of the data value chain. Again, remember, when we're trying to, to provide data, data asset value to our organization, we want to focus on the impact of the data asset to business outcomes, not the technology we're using. And that is just so hard to kind of get your, to get, to get your, arms around sometimes, especially if you've been brought up in an environment where it's all about technology, um, or if you're solely within an IT department, because the focus is uh, technology. Okay. I want to let you know you've got about 10 minutes before the Q&A. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Impact. So now we want to be able to measure, right? So let's say we prepared our data assets. We've been able to 
show value or we've been able to present them and allow consumption of them and within the organization how do we how do we determine the impact right so within all your organizations you have you have measurements metrics and kpis right you have goals uh, kpis are usually at will be at you'll have kpis at the board level and then you'll have kpis within your line of business or down to your department etc right it's good to have KPIs. They should be, they should be distinct. There should not be many, and they should be easy, quote unquote, easy to measure. But that's the only way you're going to be able to find, you know, if you're having an, an impact with the use of your data assets. Uh, regression analysis, predictive modeling. In the past, we used to call that statistics, right? I mean, really, that's all that is is t- statistics. And then, of course, you got to be careful with that, with statistics in general, right? Um, there's a lot of things that people will provide or stand behind that was based on faulty data. Uh, there's a quote from, I think it's Mark Twain, that says there are lies, damn lies, and then there's t- statistics. And that is true everywhere. You can you can mangle a statistic to provide a narrative, and I'm not saying that could be necessarily a bad thing, but if it leads to a direct negative impact to your organization, that's not good. I've seen um, analysis done where the underlying foundational data was just bad, and it led it led to certain decisions that in the end provided no value to the organization, and in one instance, expose the organization to risk. So just saying, hey, we're just going to jump in and do predictive modeling, all this nice stuff, it sounds great. But if you don't, if if the data that's being used to feed that is not from a trusted source, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to um, effectively, I, I think the biggest thing is manage risk in that regard. Business product process automation. This is very, this a lot of organizations are going through a cycle of trying to implement B, uh, BPA. Uh, I think it's a good thing. Uh, it kind of can help with uh, providing the decision making processes that can be followed and have an impact. Um, and it can actually remove some of the things that a lot of organizations use to do BPA, which is usually access database and spreadsheets, which I've seen in the past. And then we want to be able to um, you want to be able to support these as data driven processes, data monetization, right? So um, some of the speakers, including the keynotes, I think uh, Doug Laney um, t- talked to this, maybe even uh, John Ladley did. But to get values, like how you get value, how do you monetize your data, right? Now some organizations actually make money off their data because they sell it. Nielsen. Um, is one I can think of. Um, and the insurance side, there's uh, uh, Verisk, which basically provides uh, uh, data to help us, uh, data and processes to help insurers meet their obligations with uh, state regulators. Um, so, but we're not looking for just that. We want to look for data monetization within your organization. Like, again, how does it impact? the bottom line. Eventually, somewhere down the road, a data asset will materialize on a balance sheet outside of it just being goodwill. Uh, some organizations have been able to actually show data data value, the data asset value on their balance sheets. And I think over time, we'll continue to see that organizations will be able to understand and provide some kind of number uh, to that. So we need to keep that in mind as 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 well. Okay, align. Now the align category is kind of like not like part of the virtual circle, but this is just like the ongoing care and feeding, right? You need to have standards and policies, right? Uh, everybody, we all know that. Proper uh, PMO and project management, we need to have that. Marketing and communications. This is one that we need to work heavily on in our data community. Scott Taylor as an, is an excellent resource regarding this particular area about telling data stories. 
we got to get better at telling data stories so that we can effectively uh, educate our organization and help understand what they need. One of the things that I used to hear is that, well, the business doesn't know what they need, so we have to give it to them. And it's like, no, my experience over the years has told me the business knows exactly what they need. They just have a very tough time uh, communicating it, right? Because it's almost like we're talking two different languages, like we're talking German and French at the same time. I mean, that's really how it appears to me. And so we need to learn to talk in the vernacular of the business. And I think marketing can, will help with that so that we can actually provide what we're trying to do, and then we can get feedback from them. Of course, training and building a operational excellence culture is important, right? Um, and we need to, and this is one of my pet, one of my things too, any organization where I actually had a team, I was really big on training and education because I had a boss who told me one time, he goes, if you ever get to the point, you leave the organization and one day you will. I want to make sure you're the best prepared when you go to that organization, because if you're not, then I failed at my job. So ever since that particular point of time in my career, whenever I had the opportunity to lead a team, I was very, I stressed the importance of education and, and training, um, even if I know somebody was going to leave, right? Um, it, it's just the right thing to do, and it helps provide a atmosphere uh, that helps move you on this journey. And of course, regulatory compliance, if you're in a, if you're into a regulated industry, you know the importance of that and how many issues you get. Now, like I said, my experience with insurance companies, you know, once I started dealing with privacy officers um, and uh, compliance officers, I had a, such a better understanding of the concerns of the organization and a better understanding of how to manage risk. Okay, so the recap. Remember, this is a framework. It's not a prescriptive tool. It's not something you take and you lay down in front of somebody and say, we must do these. No, you look at what makes sense for your organizations, either from um, a skill set or maturity or kind of what you want to do. And some of these things you can move, the disciplines could actually move around because remember it's a, a framework. But remember, if you have a good understanding of what these disciplines are, that will provide you the most impact that you could potentially provide to your organization, which is what we want to do at the end of the day, right? We want to help our organizations go forward. Thoughts to ponder. Okay. Again, remember, it's a framework. You need to understand your organization, your industry, and you also need to understand the business strategy, right? There are some talks about that. You know, you can have a business strategy, data strategy, an IT strategy. You need to start a business strategy that should feed both your IT strategy and data strategy, which are two separate things. Uh, you want to balance the categories and disciplines based on your organization. Uh, you want to continue to develop your leadership and drive data value. You want to combine it with other frameworks, right? The DIMBOK wheel. The DIMBOK is, a, is another framework basically the primary data disciplines. If you're not familiar with that, please get familiar with it. And another one of my things is I truly try to live to this Albert Einstein quote, uh, is I have, seen, I have seen people twist themselves in the pretzels, in the pretzels to try to take care of a one in one million thing that will happen. And it's like, why? So you want to make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler. So um, that also gets an understanding of uh, minimal, vi minimal viable product and things like that. And that, um, you know, you don't have to have it correct on the first try. This is something else I had to learn through my experience, right? Is that I didn't have to be 100% correct out of the gate. I had to be the most correct I needed to be to help the organization move forward. And then I went to my next iteration. That's the way you need to kind of think of it, right? 
you want cure technical debt or data debt, but the idea is you plan for that and then use that to move forward. Uh, in conclusion, all right, so we kind of touched on the management issues, the points of data value. What is the framework? Went through the categories and disciplines. And hopefully I gave you some things to ponder. And one of the things that's in the book that Anthony kind of uses as his pet phrase throughout the book is go make an impact. So I'm asking you that within your organization, whether it be big or small, go make an impact. And with that, I'll turn it over for any questions. Thanks a lot, Gene. Um, uh, for those of you who may be interested, um, uh, the, the book that uh, Gene is referring to is available on um, on Amazon uh, and Kindle and uh, in um, uh, pardon me in Kindle form as well. So, um, uh, and if you attend next year's uh, Enterprise Data World, we'll be giving it away. <laughs> we we actually uh, gave it away uh, in 2019, um, and I'm pleased to say it was well received. I, I guess the question that um, I asked myself before we decided to publish the book, Gene, was mm -hmm. do we really need another framework? <laughs> um, but uh, Anthony had a, had a fairly compelling argument here. I mean, um, obviously this is not the same as Zachman framework or uh, Dimbach or, but right. how do you, how do you see positioning this framework versus some of the others? Cause that's a question that that's going to come up. Okay. I, I look at this framework as kind of a, as a template to follow, right? So if I was going to lay out a data management organization and I wanted to know kind of, you know, it's like, what disciplines would I need to focus on? This framework provides a, a, a guide that says, hey, I need to kind of focus these particular disciplines. Um, and one of, the, one of the things, too, is when I first saw the book, when I went, went through and read the book, it's like it was aha moments for me because we have talked about this stuff in the past, right? And But I've never seen it put down in a, in a concise enough uh, way that was easy to kind of follow and look at and digest. Because usually we would we we would we would mosh together a bunch of things. We would take the Dimbach and the Zim and the uh, Zachman framework and the uh, one used by the IBA and then you know, the one over by the data maturity and and we would try to munge them all together and try to get something and say, hey, this is kind of how we're gonna we're gonna inform our data strategy and move forward. But if I use the DLF, that that truly is my starting point for that uh, to move forward. Yeah, I I, I think, um, and and I agree with you. I think um, the the part about the the justification for publishing this that really resonated with me um, uh, when we were talking to Anthony was that you know what he was aiming for was um, a practical framework for sort of the the data organization, which is what you mentioned. What you mentioned, um, uh, not necessarily trying to define what the strategy is or right uh, or what the architecture is, but the the organization itself that's going to address those those topics. Um, and the thing that comes through time and time again, and for those of you who've not met Anthony, I mean, he's he's nothing if not direct and yes. and uh, uh, you know, I think I've got more great one-liners from his talks than than just about anybody else because he just calls calls it out. Um, We're from but, Chicago, so he needs to do that. That's, that's he uh, uh, he has such a, an irreverent style of writing, uh, but. It keeps hammering home the value uh, message, um, and it all comes back to value. And you know, if you're doing something that adds no value, then then you probably shouldn't be doing that. Um, so anyway, 
Um, there, there's a couple of uh, questions here. So um, a question, can this framework be implemented uh, and any level at, at any level, I'm gonna assume there, can this framework be implemented at any level uh, or is this more of an upper level management framework? Yes, um, the point, that's a good point. Again, you have to look at your organization and uh, maturity of it. It could it could move across the layers, right? You don't have to say, well, I need to start at the top and then work this way down, or I need to start at the bottom and work your way up. It basically is uh, where you are at the moment. Like remember, in your world, wherever you are in your organization, you may not realize it, but you have the opportunity to impact beyond your current realm of team or department, you just don't realize it yet. So you're looking at this framework that helps you provide the, an idea of how you can actually make that impact beyond your immediate team or group. And it doesn't have to be endorsed by a Baha'i or whatever like that. It'd be good if you had a data leader, like a CDO in your organization, who would basically endorse the framework um, and then you'd be able to just kind of use that as, as the guideline to move forward. But a lot of organizations don't have that. Uh, one of the things I've done, I've, I've worked at organizations where I actually sat with the CEO in organizations where I never made it past an AVP, right? So, but the, the idea is that regardless, you need to have the, the same amount of impact whether you're meeting with a CEO or an AVP to be able to get that message out. And uh, so, yeah, so it's in line to where you are. And then if you're fortunate enough to move up in your organization, take it with you up to that layer. And then, and then you'll have a more, more, more of the organization to impact. Um, Gene, can you hold the book up again, please? Yep. Uh, Chris was just asking what's the book title. It's um, <laughs> data, called Data Leadership, and the author's name is Anthony, Anthony Algman. Yeah. A-L-G-M-I-N. Yes. Um, and Rex asked if you could put the alignment slide up again because uh, he was out. Well, we're here to please, so um, there you go. Yep. <laughs> there you go. Um, uh and um, there's, there's a, a couple of other questions here, which I'm um, afraid we, we probably are not going to have time to get into much. But the, one of the points here is that uh, Zerfan says, currently most CEOs yeah. have no idea about the power of data management if properly implemented. That um, is, that, that is un, unfortunately true in uh, certain organizations, right? Like I said, uh, uh, my past experience with insurance companies, they are the laggards among laggards. Um, and so at the last organization, I actually did sit with the CEO and his leadership staff and try to, you know, go through this. Um, and uh, some of it was breaking through. I could see some of it was breaking, breaking through. But um, there was this just this thing about going to the shiny objects and immediately going to you know, analytics and, you know, IA and everything uh, yeah, everything else without an understanding you have that foundational piece. So I had to kind of, I still remember the CEO saying, hey, I'm thinking about doing this and this and this and this. He wanted to actually set aside some money to just focus on analytics and nothing else. And I said, I'm very intrigued by that particular uh, suggestion, really intrigued. I said, one of the things we need to focus on before we can really move on that, though, is we have a lot of foundational issues we have to address first, right? And we were working through these. And, you know, then I could see the look on his face, and I'm thinking, eh, I probably shouldn't have said that to him. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, I'm trying to be true to what I see uh, and not just kiss butt just so I can get the CEO to like me i i didn't want him sitting inside money that could potentially go down a hole and then expose us to risk yeah all right uh we're basically at our time here so uh gonna have to wrap things up 
uh, but Jean, thanks very much. Uh, uh, appreciate you uh, talking about the leadership framework with us. Um, and uh, let me see, we're going to be back in 10 minutes with the final presentation of the conference, our last keynote. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Um, and we will hopefully uh, see you in a few more minutes at the top of the hour. Thanks again, yeah. Tony. Bye-bye. Thanks, Gene. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.